Hi, I'm Ted Price from Insomniac Games, and on today's episode of the AIAS Game Maker's Notebook, I have the distinct pleasure of talking to Genova Chen, who is the creative director at that game company. Genova's background as both a computer scientist and an artist gives him a unique perspective on designing games. And during our conversation, Genova explains how the intersection of art and human nature creates unconventional and unique experiences in games like Flower, Journey, and Sky. Please join me as Genova gives the kind of insight that I think no one else can in this industry. Welcome to the Game Makers Notebook, a podcast featuring a series of in-depth one-on-one conversations between game makers providing a thoughtful, intimate perspective on the business and craft of interactive entertainment. The Game Maker's Notebook is presented by the Academy of Interactive Arts and Sciences, a member-driven organization dedicated to the recognition and advancement of interactive entertainment. Thank you for joining. Thank you, Tad, and this is a lovely place to be here. Uh, Thanks. Well, uh, just to fill in for our listeners, we are at Insomniac, we're in our, uh, sort of our podcast slash live streaming room mm-hmm. and uh, Genova you've never been over here so even though we live in the same city we never had a chance to go to each other's various uh, locations it's almost an hour of drive you know you know an hour I can fly to San Jose <laughs> <laughs> yeah. that's the crazy thing about Los yeah. Angeles right it yeah. just takes so long mm-hmm. and and to ask you a crazy question that has nothing to do with games when automated cars come out are you going to get one I've already got one. Oh, you do? Yes. Uh, I have a Tesla Model 3, and it's capable of a full autopilot when it's legal. No kidding. Yeah. That's great to hear, because personally, I can't wait to, till I have an automated car mm-hmm. and I don't have to worry about staying awake. Uh, I'm going to say, if, when I first used the autopilot feature, it's kind of scary. Really? And, uh, it, it just kind of gives me heart attacks sometimes. I'm like, is this going to hit a car? But after you use it for a while, you kind of just like, you turn that part of driving off, um, and from that point on, it's just using your cell phone. <laughs> no kidding. Yeah, and I definitely look forward for the future. I, recently, I thought Elon Musk was asking for video game developers to develop games in their cars. I'm just like, really? <laughs> <laughs> um, but that future is coming faster than I thought. Hmm. You know, um, last year I just thought. There's no way this thing can drive on the free roads. And, you know, then they announced they have something in the work and they showed a video of the car doing that. And, you know, they uh, they they announced they think they're going to get full autonomous last year. But, you know, now it's 2018. I think it's it's going to come soon. And a lot of my friends, are, including my parents, who don't know how to drive cars, and I'm like, Okay, well, you should never, and in the future, all the cars is going to drive themselves. Well, that's a great point. I yeah. I have a bunch of kids, and <laughs> my oldest kids are right. excited about driving cars, but my youngest two have very little interest in it, and mm-hmm. that's because I think they know that they're not going to have to worry about it. Yeah, I, I heard that the uh, the the American youth are like losing their interest in getting driver's license. I would think that would put the uh, car manufacturers in a in a state of maybe semi panic, <laughs> because I mean, unless they're on board and creating automated cars, this lust for muscle cars and mm-hmm. the the next greatest thing that you can drive. You know, is that, that's go away. very interesting because uh, I'm very sure the youth would prefer to use their smartphone in a car rather than driving the car. Yeah. And what is the new culture for muscle? You know, like muscle car, it's uh, this the thing to show, you know, the the manhood, right? right. Like, is it going to be just about your pro gamer seats for the future when you stream your game? Like, how do you even show that? Um, I guess car was a big thing that represents you when you arrive. Right. Um, but I think the future is more about what, what, what represents you when you're arriving in the social media. Yeah, there you go. You know, <sighs> So I, you know, I think for us as game makers too, it's it's exciting to think that people will be playing games in the cars, right? <laughs> You'll have your Switch or your iPhone or maybe even some other form of a PlayStation or Xbox mm-hmm. or PC in your car and you can play, for example, Sky mm-hmm. when you're on the road. And I, 
I think that's for, for me as a game player, pretty exciting too. Yeah. Uh, lately, you know, as I was developing mobile games, I, I tried to play as much mobile games as, as I could. Uh, and I'm trying to get my wife into it. She's not really a gamer, but like my ambition has always been trying to make people in my, you know, social circle to care about game and to be able to get a good taste of what a good game is and, you know, ultimately respect developers. And so I would drag my wife into playing these games. And I noticed that, you know, playing on on the go or play a mobile game is completely different than a play a console game. Mm. It's, you know, you know, I, I think the best analogy is like console game is like you, you pay your tickets, you go to a really good theater with a really large screen and good sound speakers, you know, with people you really want to share this you know, kind of intense experience with. Um, mobile game is more like, you know, just checking your smartphone and, you know, everything is trying to compete for your attention, right? Like in the middle of a game, you get a call, you get a text message, you got a Snapchat. Everything could potentially just grab your attention away. And they were like, what was I into? Oh, yeah, I was thinking about checking Facebook, trying to talk to somebody. But then the Facebook feed just dragged my attention for another 10 minutes. I was like, what am I watching? Wait, why was I here in the first place? <laughs> oh, yeah, I need to talk to somebody. Um yeah, it's 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 a it's a brutal attention battleground. And, yeah. uh, I remember going to uh, a Netflix uh, presentation where Reed Hastings was talking about their strategy is to compete not just with you know streaming, but with video games, with everything, because you know ultimately we only have twenty four seven, right? And uh, modern day with the device and the internet. You can reach them anywhere, anytime. And so ultimately, how much time do you want your audience to give you You know that, that you think is valuable? I think this is ultimately uh, uh, the question for, for people who want to create value. Mm -hmm. right? you know, there are people who just want to grab your attention regardless of what they do. Um, but... I think I've sidetracked the topic. Well, that's okay. Well, you yeah. brought up something that I'm really interested in. You mm -hmm. said that you try to get your wife to play more mobile games. Mm -hmm. And I think by extension, you've been encouraging others who maybe don't play games to, mm -hmm. to play games. Yeah. What are some of the mobile games that you have suggested to mm -hmm. bring them into our world? Well, I, I think it's more like me and my wife, well, she doesn't know me when we first get to know each other. I certainly ask her to play my games so she get a sense who I am. I, I think it's very interesting that how her view on game developers is completely different. Hmm. Um, so when I first met her, uh, that's after I finished Journey. Um, and she... Her, when, we, when we talk, I had a lot of ego there, right? You know, after we won the game of the year, I felt like, oh, I'm somebody. I, I did something great. Um, but she doesn't care, <laughs> right? And, uh, you know, her, one of her friends is a, a mobile developer. I think they uh, made, they called Fun Plus, uh, which is kind of like a casual social game on Facebook, but they're like number two, two Zynga. So they are very successful. So when, when I first met her, she just asked me, how much money do you make? <laughs> I'm like, no, no, we don't make money by <laughs> making art games, you know? Uh, and, but then at the same time, I have this sense of, you know, we make great things. I don't think your casual game friends would really make that things, right? I mean, but she couldn't tell the difference. Like I, her favorite game is Plants vs. Zombies. <clears throat> um, I can understand. It's cute. And she played a lot. And so then I asked her to play Flower and she actually really enjoyed the game. Okay. And I asked her to play Journey. I thought Journey was made really simple. There's only two buttons. You know, we thought we made it to be easy enough for anyone to play, but she couldn't finish Journey. Wow. And so she had to find a friend who of her, and she also played video games. So she finished the game for her. 
and she has to watch the game. And uh, yeah, I mean, that's kind of like her really exposure to console games. She owns a PlayStation for almost five years. She never used it to play a game. She just used it to play uh, Blu-ray discs. Um, and I think only after she played the game and then, you know, I show her the words and all these things, she starts to understand, oh, okay, video game can be like artistic. Yeah. Um, but, you know, the, the industry changes so much in the in the past 10 years. I, I don't even know how, how, how to begin. I mean, I, I guess I'm getting old and I'm getting cynical and <laughs> to, uh, um, yeah, I mean, a, a lot of people, um, because my wife works in the finance industry, they do a lot of uh, merger acquisition or IPO, and a lot of these companies are game companies. Um, and you know, like she knows people from like uh, Angry Bird Rovio, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and Supercell, and you know, like there's a wide range of game studios. It's, yeah. I think it's 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 a, it's a tough time for for me to explain. To her like who's good who's not yeah you know i have a very different view I, I think i'm more aligned with the academy right like i think people make really great emotional experience you know that leaves the impression on people is the best game yeah um well, let's talk a little bit about mm -hmm. that because you've made you and that game company have made a very clear choice to mm -hmm. create unconventional games games that mm -hmm. to your to what you said before are more about the message and uh, not necessarily big commercial plays. Mm -hmm. So have you ever had a situation where somebody has told you, hey, Genova, that idea, it's just never going to sell. You're not going to make any money. Why are you doing this? Uh, I think uh, just two days ago, someone was telling me this. <laughs> really? And they told me Sky is never going to be a big game, big successful game. Uh, I hope it wasn't somebody on your team. Uh, no, no, no. It's uh, it's someone from uh, you know respectful publisher, and actually, I really respect their opinions because you know, after all, you work on a, some some game for a very long time, you lose that sense of how this is. I mean, when we work on Journey, we never thought it's going to be a game of the year game. Right. Uh, we just thought, well, you know, finally we got about to finish it. You know, it's so much tough work and I hope people like it <laughs> um, but yeah I mean uh, so how do you respond to that because mm -hmm. your games are so unique and I think they create this really neat uh, sense of excitement for for those mm -hmm. of us who are hardcore gamers and and see something uh, mm -hmm. see you taking creative risks and putting your you and your and your team's emotions out there on display through mm -hmm. the games that you make how do you respond to somebody who is taking that sort of hard-nosed financial approach? Yeah, I, I think you summarize it well. It is like my professional job is to take creative risk. Mm -hmm. And the for someone from a big comp publisher company who think about, you know, the the P&Ls, the earnings, they do see us as risky. I mean, we I was talking to Tencent, you know, uh, quite a few times uh, about potentially publishing Sky. Um, and their feedback was, usually we like to embrace in a risky project where it's risky on one aspect, but the other thing are safe. Like, you know, if it's a risky concept, but the business model is safe, then, you know, we, we, we're happy to take it. But you have risky concept, Risky business model, you know, and unproven market. There's too many risks that I feel like we are not really interested. Unless you prove you are already successful, then we're interested in publishing. Right? I mean, it's, uh, <laughs> well, that's the conundrum today, isn't it? When it comes to when it yeah. comes to publishing. But on mm -hmm. the other hand, you're you're working on a mobile platform that has the largest install player base mm -hmm. in the world, mm -hmm. and you're also embracing multiplayer. Mm -hmm. which is also is extremely exciting and it makes a lot of sense mm -hmm. for that platform. And what I've heard you say already publicly about uh, about Sky is that you are you built it from the ground up to support the swipe mechanic mm -hmm. that you see in yeah. in in on mobile versus trying to take an idea that was maybe originally made for console mm -hmm. and bringing it over. So those to me are all really positive statements about the potential for the game. Mhm. Mm yeah, uh, I mean, we are taking all these steps. The The irony is nothing is absolute. Um, when we 
you spend all these years trying to explore how to make a input scheme simple and intuitive for the touch screen the <laughs> public are all caught up if you play uh you know uh player and uh, battleground mm -hmm. right and or the fortnite you would realize hey that's basically a twin stick controller mapped onto the screen right and, which people hated when we first started developing the game back in 2014 right people were like this virtual sticks thing sucks the stick is better everybody's saying that right so i feel the same way uh and that's why we dive in so much into finding what's as good for the touch screen by itself but you know, six years later, the feedback is different because so many people were brought up with these virtual sticks. You know, oh, just think about all the kids who play Minecraft. Yeah. You know, they're like, where's the virtual stick? <laughs> you know, what is this new, you know, new control scheme I have to learn? Just give me the twin sticks. It's already working. That's fascinating. Uh, yeah. And uh, I hear this from, you know, China, I hear this from, you know, various type of people, you know, like mostly those people who don't play console games would ask for virtual state. The people who play console games would say, just give me the controller. <laughs> right. right. Um, and yeah, it's, it's kind of like, it's, I think the biggest difference I have been facing today compared to, you know, 10 years ago when we were working on PlayStation is just the amount of information. Hmm. Um, you know, today we, we're living in this big data age. We know exactly where people are quitting the game, having difficulty with the game, or complain about a control scheme. What are they complaining about? You know, like back then, when we were on console, we, we have to like bring five, 10 people, let them play the game, and we have to do this uh, focus group, trying to be neutral and get really useful feedback from these people. But today, you can just send a build out to, you know, Anybody who's playing at home, you know, they don't have to care about how you think about them. They just talk to the microphone and you get all kinds of people who you, you would have never thought about playing your game. And for me, the most crazy one is some guy who's driving a car is test playing our game. I can hear like people honking at him. Really? Yeah. So I was he's just not like, driving an automated car. He's driving. He's a driving a real car. car and. <laughs> And I can tell he's in the car and he's playing this game. And I'm just like, this is, he's going to kill somebody. <laughs> or he's, he's trying to make some extra money while he's probably a trucker or something. <laughs> um, yeah, and, and you get all this data. And I almost felt like, you know, I might have been uh, swayed by the data too much, uh, you know, ritual, ritual uh, kind of post-mortem, right? Um, Did that data yeah. help you understand who your players really are? The people mm -hmm. who gravitate to Journey, to Sky, mm -hmm. to Flower? Yeah, this is like the first question whenever I talk to someone who don't know about us. They were just like, what are your you know, market? Who are you making this game for? Right? <laughs> and I think that's like the artist side of me have a very idealistic view of the world and you know i i often tell them i said you know like growing up people go to watch film together as a family they go to theme park together as a family and why can't people just play a game together as a family right i mean just makes sense and everybody grew up now have played a video game everybody's video game literate yeah and but where is a video game that is the equivalent of a Pixar movie or the Disneyland where everybody can have fun together, but, you know, the adults can still be emotionally engaged. I'm not talking about, uh, you know, uh, Minecraft or, you know, Lego Star Wars or something. I'm talking about something that, that inspired adults, you know, just like a Pixar movie or any Disney movie, really. Um, you know, something that adults and children or husband and wife can do together. Um, and that's just a very, I, I think that's just like, duh, obviously there's a market there, you know, someone's going to make something, right? And so it's a no-brainer for me to to pursuing for that direction because, you know, my my ultimate goal is to earn respect from the society towards games. And how could you earn respect? 
you have to entertain them, the people who play games, their family, their children, and give them something that they really feel is speaking to them. Yeah. I think and, that's special. I mean, I, yeah. I know personally, and this is yeah. totally anecdotal, mm -hmm. that it has, your games have provided that experience for me. I played mm -hmm. all the way through Flower and Journey with my oldest daughter. And in both situations, those were bonding moments. And we were taking turns with the controller, mm -hmm. but we were experiencing it as a family. And because there was no real uh, heavy conflict and we mm -hmm. got to interpret the story as we saw fit, it, yeah. it sparked conversation about what you and your team intended. We talked mm -hmm. about that, especially with Flower, because we really had to sort of build our own little story around mm -hmm. what was going <laughs> yeah, on. Yeah, I mean, that's, that was good, that's what that's I want to. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So it's kind of like you, what the story you told me is actually what I was hoping that, uh, you know, Sky could inspire people to do. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, because not everybody's going to, have the time or the, the setup where they can have, you know, like all the people in the same room and going through it together. Um, yeah. And, but at the same time, it's kind of hard because uh, when we look at the market, if you search for uh, family playing games together, right. And uh, you might find some images of people playing Wii. Yeah. Um, but in my home country, China, uh, where it's right now the largest mobile game market. You search for family playing games together, you couldn't find a single image wow. of a family sitting together playing hmm. games. That just doesn't exist. It's kind of like... Is, is that a cultural thing, or is it just that there really aren't any games? Because there was never a console in China. Hmm, okay. Right. So the only access to game is uh, PC and mobile. And... Yeah, I mean, it's um, so. So a lot of people was challenging me on um, like, well, if it's kind of chicken egg question. If nobody knows you're supposed to play games with your family, how are you supposed to, you know, make money out of it, <laughs> right? Um, yeah, as there's uh, there's a lot of questions that I don't think I can answer in a in a rational way. But yeah, well, that question you just yeah. stated, right? how can yeah. you make money if you're making games for families? Mm -hmm. To me, there's an obvious answer. If you mm -hmm. have a family and you want to connect with them, then those games are like gold. Mm -hmm. Because today in today's world where our kids are playing video games and we're playing video games, mm -hmm. there really aren't many better ways to have fun together other than uh, if you happen to be able to play sports together or maybe you're going camping together, mm -hmm. but not everybody has access to those those events. Mm -hmm. Video games, for the most part, are accessible to everybody. Yeah, yeah. And uh, in a way, uh, what happened is some of these mobile games become so uh, universally adopted that usually you, I mean, I, I run to these teenage girls who play you know, a Fortnite or, you yeah. know, uh, the the mobile version of uh, League of Legends. I was like, why are you playing this game? You don't seem like the demographic for this type of game. She's just like, well, because all my friends in the yeah. class are playing and I just feel like I do, if I don't play, I couldn't blend into the culture anymore. I have to play it. And that was just kind of mind boggling for me. It's just like, it's it's not a game designed for them that actually did it, but it's like this other game that is so popular that all these people convert it into a game player. Um, so with Sky, you're taking mm -hmm. that, you're in some ways filling a, a niche that's being, in a way, filled by other games that weren't designed for it. Mm -hmm. And I, watching the trailers that you've put out and the gameplay mm -hmm. that you put out so far what's in, what's intrigued me really is this idea that you can uncover mysteries and discover a story together as a family mm -hmm. and so when it comes to you and the team deciding on what you're going to do how big is how important is presenting mysteries and presenting a story that isn't explicitly told mm -hmm. that's my impression from mm -hmm. watching sky and also from playing flower and journey uh, yeah, it, we internally we call it interactive storytelling. We call it story digging. Okay, uh, that's, I mean, that's a great term. So, so 
Because ultimately, the player has to piece together information and put a storyline themselves, and that's what human does. You know,、uh, if if you put me in the desert and there's nothing, but in the distance there's a little、uh, roof. I mean, a hundred percent, I'm going to there. I'm not、yeah. going anywhere else because I'm a sucker to human civilization and stories.、Um, And I just find, you know, like naturally we put story together. If we sit in a train, we see somebody, that person looks sad. We are already thinking about what happened to him. You know, what's his relationship with the lady next to him? What happened? Did they have a fight? You know, it's just our、uh, empathy, really,、uh, it, or, or curiosity, and all these kind of what I consider as good nature of humanity,、um, and. Yeah, like when we were taught in the film school, what we say is "show don't tell."、Mm-hmm. Uh, it's when I was in advertisement class, people would say, "Don't ever repeat the same message with two different elements." You know, if you put an apple on on the the the, the advertisement, don't say an apple below an apple image. Like that's just waste of effort. And I felt like for video game, it's the same. It's like If you want to communicate something, you let the player to figure it out. You know, it's, it's through interactivity, right? You know, if you have a visual medium, use the visuals. Don't just say it, and you know, let them use the, the strongest、uh, form of media to to explore a story.、Um, and so, there are various ways of interactive storytelling. There's the You know, tell tell. There's quantic dream. For our philosophy, it's more like we want to give the player the choice and the, the control to, you know, consume or to engage to understand the narrative of the world.、Uh, and journey and flower is more of a narrative of yourself, like what you go through.、Mm-hmm. Journey is two things. It's like what you go through, and then what do you think. Had happened here,、um, and it's、uh, we almost have the two storyline, and a lot of times we get confused. Like, what are we trying to make this for? <laughs> are we just trying to tell the history of this world, or are we trying to make the player's narrative interesting?、Uh, and yeah, and、uh, you know, with Sky, it's the same thing. We're we're, we're burying all these story bits, hoping after you dig them out that you can piece them together and come、uh, come to something that's interesting.、Uh, but th- at the same time, the challenging part is often when you're busy burying stuff, you forgot about how the player's experience going to be as they play through the game.、Uh, a lot of people were saying like, video game is not like a movie. You can't write a story in a linear format because people have agency, right? But for me, ultimately, human beings are linear.、Uh, time is linear, and no matter how you play an open world game, if you sequence everything you experience, it's still a linear experience. As long as that memory is linear, you should be able to craft、uh, emotional arc in a in a memory. So ultimately, it's like how can we shape your memory? Uh, to create feeling,、uh, what was console? It was relatively simple. You can have people sit down, stare at the TV for ninety to ninety minutes to two hour. You can guarantee what they're gonna experience.、Uh, with mobile now, yeah, there's a. <laughs> it's gonna be sporadic, right? Like it's just that nature, and yeah.、Uh, I was playing Sky last night, and some people dragged me on to play the game. But then I, my wife gave me food I have to eat, and I can't leave that game. So I'm like just putting down the phone, just holding on the hands of someone. They are playing the game. I'm just eating, and then my wife started talking to me, and I missed out what's going on there. <laughs> it's just, uh, uh, yeah, and、uh, it's it's a bunch of new challenges. I I think that's kind of the fun part of this project is just it's hard. <laughs> Well, so when you see people experiencing the game in certain ways, does that influence big design decisions that you're making as you finish the game up? Oh yeah. What kind、um, of things have you, for example, been surprised by as you've been seeing people play early versions of the game? Um, 
I think, you know, initially we, the developer, were the consumers first. We play the game and we will pretend these sessions and afterwards we'll say, that, yeah, I really hated that thing that happened to me. Um, and then we start to see uh, beta testers to play the game and then they start to, you know, kind of develop this behavior that I've never thought about. <laughs> and okay. I, I think with online game, it's always, you, you feel like um, a parent of a little community and there are certain behavior you don't allow in this family, right? And sometimes you don't know that's something you really don't allow until it happens. Um, so when we, uh, just an example, when we were doing very early version, we had a kind of friends and family test. Uh, Sky is a game about giving um, and a lot of the economy happens in giving rather than buying, right? And so, um, we we made a very simple uh, system where, let's say, if you really want something, uh, you need someone to give it to you, right? And so some player would ask their dad to get an account so their dad can just keep giving him gifts, right? Like just unlimited giving. And I was just like, oh, that's just really break the, the, the balance of the game. You know, if you have a rich dad who can just buy you all these things, <laughs> Nobody likes to see that happen in the community, so we have to figure out a way to prevent someone just having a rich uncle or something to like spoil the situation. Um, and then we have the opposite. Initially, our our knee-jerk reaction is, "Oh, you can only give one, right? Like it only matters once. It's like voting in in America. You can't just because you're rich, you, you can't vote multiple times. You can only vote once." Um, but then what happened is uh, you got people who's uh, really popular. I mean, they like to uh, dress up really cute and do all these fancy moves to uh, beg for for votes. Uh, and we start to call them the uh, the candle beggars. Uh, they they just go around to talk to everybody, trying to be as uh, applied as they could until they get their vote, and then they move on to the next person. <laughs> Like the moment you get your vote, they disappear, right? What an interesting commentary on person on just people, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's uh, probably. Do you see that behavior? I mean, I'm, I imagine you know people who have that behavior in uh -huh. real life. Oh yeah, I mean, uh, really, I mean, I started to experience that from Journey. I mean, Journey, we want to have people help each other, mm -hmm. and that's a very tough challenge itself because most of the time people don't like each other when there's a conflict of interest. Um, and what I learned from journey was that it's not about like punishing people for what you don't want them to do. Uh, it's about giving them the least amount of feedback for things that you don't want them to do. Uh, and it's, I, I talked to a child psychologist who mentioned about, you know, gamer and virtual worlds. When you go from reality to a virtual world, you become a child. Because in the virtual world, the rules, the traditions, the morale, uh, the moral values uh, don't apply in virtual world. That's why there's so many trolls on the internet. They're just testing the boundaries. Like a baby likes to test the boundaries, right? Uh, I just had a baby recently, so uh, I'm sure events. you have your, your experience as well. Uh, and so in a, in, a, in a virtual society, when everybody's like testing the boundaries because we are human beings, we're curious animals, how do you make people behave more towards a certain direction that you believe in and how to prevent? It's all about controlling the amount of feedback. Uh, and through journey, like this kind of painful process, what I learned is you can make people do anything if you structure the world and the society right. You know, um, and so coming back to the candle, uh, the candle bagger situation, or the the spoil your kids situation. Uh, we 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 start to you know try to play various feedback to prevent certain behaviors. Um, it's almost like lawmaking, <laughs> but in right? a very subtle way. Yeah, like. very subtle way. You can't make it like we told you. You have to do this. Like we have to make you feel like you're smart. You figure out that doing this is better, right? Yeah. So. It's, so we talk about how the best practice of design is a nudge where 
you know, it's not about leash. It's about nudging. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, we, that's a great philosophy. We debate at Insomniac all the time, how much mm -hmm. handholding we want to do mm -hmm. for players, because at some point players need to know the rules if they're going to proceed. Mm -hmm. But there's easily a line you can cross when you're being prescriptive. And then yeah. that sense of discovery is gone. <laughs> I would say we are making that mistake every day. It's a, it's a very uh, delicate balance. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Well, I think it's great that you're getting consistent and constant feedback from players who are, I, I presume, not part of that game company mm -hmm. uh, online and showing you new behaviors all the time. Do you expect that after launch you'll be doing, you'll be seeing even more unusual and unexpected behaviors and then making tweaks to yeah so so it. the thing the interesting thing about uh, mobile games are uh, these days is you, you can do soft launch yeah so right now our game is in uh, a few a handful of countries uh, you know Sweden Philippines uh, New Zealand and Singapore so so they're a real player they are using a real store they see our game as already launched yeah. obviously it's not as polished as we, we would expect but they are definitely uh, behaving like a real player how they would do i think it's very different you know when i was working on playstation we brought in about 25 players to play journey when it's almost finished right five people at a round and we thought that feedback was like really good but so when we entered the mobile era, we start to do a play test the same way. We'll bring these mobile players into our studio. We have them sit down on a couch, give them a device, let them play. Um, but what we get from this group of people and later compared to like what you get just by people recording and playing at home, the quality is completely different. Mm. Um, I think there's always this feeling of, oh, I come to someone's house or their office. I'm here to getting paid to play their game, so I have to say something nice, right? Otherwise, I feel uncomfortable, <laughs> right? And the people who play in their bedroom on their pajamas, they are brutal. Yeah. Well, do you see, yeah. so if you've soft launched in several countries, are you talking about tens of thousands of players right now who are uh -huh. checking it out? Yeah. How do you sift that data? How do you make it? And this is sort of a very, uh, a less... This is more of a business-like question. How do you yeah. take those comments and aggregate them and translate them in a way that is useful for the team? Yeah, it's 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 a hard thing. Uh, my, I, I have to say, it's kind of like the data is dangerous, and you don't want everybody to prematurely react into data. Mm -hmm. I've made a few mistakes like that, um, and ultimately, data to me is almost like how a doctor reads symptoms uh i have a real example my mom went through a lot of surgeries she has glaucoma and when i took her to ucla and the first person coming to to see my mom is the you know the the interns the the, the students who's learn who's still learning right they were just there to take the measurements yeah and as they measure they would be like oh your mom's eye pressure is too high you you need surgery right away, right? And I, I got super anxious, right? Like, oh, geez, really? Shit. <laughs> and and then the next person coming is like the more experienced uh, kind of staff doctor. And they, then they will look at my mom and I'll be like, oh, the, the previous guy says my mom needs surgery right away. What do you think? And then this person will be like, oh, okay. Yeah, I mean, this, is, this, is, this number is pretty high, you know? And if I were... Uh, you know, the doctor, I'm going to say she needs surgery right away. And then I'm just like, oh, crazy. <laughs> I mean, this is going to be bad. And finally, the doctor came in who was like really experienced. He's, he's just like, uh, the previous, I told him, the previous two doctors told me my mom's pressure is too high. We need to get surgery right away. His first reaction is, there's no way her eye pressure is going to be this number. Hmm. Let's retake the test. Right. Yeah. And the test is much lower. I was like, but how is the test so high? Well, because that when that guy measured your mom's eye pressure, he applied his finger onto her eyeball, so he, he got higher pressures. It happens to a lot of these people with smaller eyes, you know, because these interns they they don't pay attention, so yeah. they never trust. 
their measurements, <laughs> right? Like, if that doctor just said, "Oh yeah, the pressure the pressure is high," my mom would went to surgery that day. Right. But he had the experience. He know people make these mistakes. He knows how to re- read a wrong situation like that. And same thing. Then my mom had surgery, and when she went back to China, she's feeling some uncomfortableness. She went to the Chinese doctor, and they were like, "My mom's eye get red, right?" So they were like, "Well, it must be that the surgery she took in America is failing. We can't fix this, you know. Huh. You you got you got to go to talk to the doctor in America. And then once my mom come back to America, she see the doctor." We thought it's going to be a serious issue. The doctor says, "Oh, it looks like she's allergic to the eye drops. Let's change the eye drop." Gone, right? It's just like I think. So the experience allows you to sift through the data and pick out what's right. meaningful it's, more it's the, quickly. It's the same thing. It's like I started not as a very experienced doctor, and all this data comes in. I'm just like, "Oh, okay. Well, these are interesting." You know, like. People are leaving a lot here. Mm. Why are they leaving, right? And we, it's the data just says they are leaving a lot in this particular part of the game, but everybody have different opinions. Yeah. Someone says, "Oh, maybe they haven't fly yet, so they didn't even see the exciting thing." Obviously, they left. Or maybe they haven't made friends in the game, right? Or maybe they, uh, the control sucks. Or maybe it, the the performance is too low, so it's very hot on your phone. That's also why they quit. Right, like it's it's just so many different way you can read the data, and you know when we first react to the data without further evaluation, we end up changing the game a little bit. But mm. then that doesn't really solve the problem, right? Like sometimes you can put a couple uh, duct tapes on the top, but that doesn't change the root problem. Yeah, yeah, it's it's kind of like it is really just like a doctor, right? You have a game and the data just tells you there's something wrong about it, but you know, is that a stomach ache? Is that a bad bug? Uh, uh, sorry, uh, f- yeah, it, it's it's all kinds of possibility. Yeah, uh, and yeah, I guess uh, I've made a lot of mistakes to felt like you know at least now I will always have a very uh, suspicious and reserved view on any new data because. Overreacting is always bad, mm-hmm. um, but I, I kind of geeked out on this. I love <laughs> what, it. I what mean, are we talking about? That's a great analogy. Yeah. It's a, it's something I think is useful for all designers. If you can mm-hmm. think like a doctor, an experienced doctor, and evaluate each set of data based on your experience versus mm-hmm. your gut versus your sort of knee jerk reaction, right? Then the changes you'll make will be more measured. Yeah. So speaking of making changes, when you're discussing making changes to the game with the team, how does that process work? Do you do you have a collaborative, consensus-driven mm-hmm. decision-making process, or is it something else? Uh, I would I would say that our process is probably not the best process. By the way, my, my question was totally leading, so I apologize for that. Uh, <laughs> but well, so why? What what kind of things? What works for you guys when uh-huh. you have to make one of those difficult decisions about a core component mm-hmm. of the game? I, I, so Sky is not out. You know, I wouldn't use Sky as example because I don't know if the decision we made was the right decision. Uh, with Journey, it's easier to look back and see, okay, you know, uh, there are definitely, I, I would think there's three kinds of decision making. There's democracy, mm-hmm. where everybody vote and, you know, the majority wins. And that tends to generate the worst <laughs> yeah. outcome. I don't know why, but it happened to be the case, just looking back. Um there's unanimous agreement mm-hmm. on a decision, and that's usually good. And then there's these kind of uh, power decision making where the leads decide to do it a certain way, and even though the others don't agree. Um, personally, I I believe in the last one when that lead is passionate about it. Okay, you know when they are so passionate about it, even though in 
confronting with all kinds of rational reason why they shouldn't do it. They still want to do it. They end up doing it in their own time over the weekend. That's usually when things work. Yeah. Um, I don't know why, but this uh, this is uh, this end up being very tough because you know like supporting someone who believes in something, the people who didn't believe in it will get hurt. Yeah, and and journey was a very painful process. You know, a lot of people have a lot of passion; they believe in things, and we don't have the money all the time to allow them to do it. And you know. So, I, I would think that those decisions that's driven by passion are, are more likely to succeed. It's not about being right; it's about just whether the person wants to put themselves into it to make it work. Yep. Um, I I agree. I mean, I I mm-hmm. think you, your passion can make things right because mm-hmm. when we are faced with a difficult creative decision in games, there isn't any right or wrong. Mm-hmm. Right? We just don't know. Nobody has, in many cases, nobody's done that thing before. Yeah. I mean, I look at your games and what, you're, what you do with your games, and you're doing things that nobody's done and making suppositions that are you know, creatively risky. But who can, who can tell what's going to work? So, if, yeah, if you have passion, it becomes sort of a self-fulfilling prophecy that it, it can work. Yeah, I mean, this, this happens, uh, you, know, you know, with myself, you know, I... I think when I was doing it, it's definitely a double-edged sword because if I believe in something and other people don't and I end up doing all this extra work to make it work, it disencourages other people. True. Right? And, you know, when back then when we were a smaller studio, there's only this field of guys, you know, I can do that all the time. But as the team gets bigger... You know, every time I do a power play like that, people, you know, disengage. And yeah. I start to see the attrition of that. And as the team get bigger, the better way looking back is to make those people feel passionate about something, you know. And when they really believe it and let them do it. And I think I still have to learn that myself, you know. Sometimes I'm just very rational. I'm like, I don't think this is going to work. There's reason one, two, three, you know, I, all these reasons. And yeah, ultimately, I, I trust the passion of the people. <laughs> how, well, I'm yeah. sure there are times where you have to decide, make some pretty big decisions. And so, mm-hmm. how do you how do you pick your particular battles that you want to engage in? Mm. I, yeah, I I think we get lost all the time. And one thing that I feel is very important is to. Um, I think Steve Jobs mentioned about his cancer and how his cancer made him be able to prioritize mm. a lot more efficiently. And I, I, I had a similar experience when I was working on Journey where, where I thought I have brain cancer, cancer. And so for three months, I don't know the answer of it, right? I just assume something's wrong, you know, that could be terminal. Wow. And that allowed me to think through everything in life. Uh, you know, should I quit my job now? Should I go to see my parents? Should I marry, get married? Should I have a kid? Should I go around the world? Should I do this and that? And ultimately, after I go through all the options, I realized that finishing the game is probably the most important thing I can do or the most valuable thing I can leave to the society. And then it's just about making the game better. And thinking I'm probably going to die before the game ships. What's most important is to create a clear direction. So even if I die, the direction can be passed along, right? Uh, And that helped me to prioritize. Um, On the contrary, with Sky, it's actually less intense because I'm not thinking I'm going to die, right? And and a a lot of the, the kind of time we spend exploring in a retrospective I felt because we had more money, uh, we were able to afford to let people try and make mistakes. Um, but if in a much tighter environment where with less money or tighter budget, we probably would have used a gut instinct cause, right? Rather than 
being a civil way, okay, let's try that. You know, that doesn't work. Let's try the other one, right? Like, um, yeah, I mean, it's inevitably a difficult process for creatives because I think we need the, that pressure to uh, afford letting these people making guts calls. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> and, but if these people are ma making guts calls, they, they tend to stomp onto other people and make other people feel unhappy. And so I, I, I don't know what's the optimal solution here. Ted. Well, I, it's a, it's a great discussion. I don't think there is an answer. It's like most creative decisions in games. You have to sort of feel it out mm -hmm. and understand the dynamics of your team. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, so speaking of team, how would you describe the culture at that game company, given that you guys have produced games that are so unique? What, what's what's magic to you about the culture? Mm. Uh, we used to be neighbor to Riot Games. OK. So during lunchtime, we often see Riot, Riot Games people, uh, you know, at restaurants. And so it's very clear, like that's a right guy, and we are not. <laughs> uh, and I, I think the culture is defined by the the leadership, by the people who who, you know, are leading in the company. Mm -hmm. uh, just because when we founded TGC, it's a bunch of us who are students who are indies. I mean, we can't afford to recruit anyone. Nobody would join us. We're just a bunch of kids. Uh, so it's this, you know, always question everything, you know, just because it works in other places doesn't, ne doesn't necessarily mean it will work here. Uh, this kind of very, uh, academic or somewhat cynical view on everything is kind of happening in TGC. So we have a lot of people who are smart and probably think way too much on everything. <laughs> yeah. I wouldn't you say that applies to the game industry in general? I mean, we have so many smart people in the game industry uh -huh. and yeah. I think in many ways we've been trained to question everything mm -hmm. because we've been playing games since most of us have been playing games since we were uh, able to walk mm -hmm. and games challenge our our expectations our, our views of reality and i see that in insomniac all the time people mm -hmm. are always challenging a decision or a direction that we're heading because that's the way we're built in at least <laughs> in this in this industry which in, in some ways allows us to evolve very much more quickly perhaps than some of the more traditional industries yeah, I think what it defines TGC is that we believe we are making something fresh, something mm -hmm. people haven't seen. I mean, it's a it's a it's a ship, it's a pirate ship that explores the new areas. <laughs> a pirate ship, I love yeah, it. Okay, yeah, yeah. So, so people feel we are doing cool stuff, but at the same time, you know. Uh, Pirate ships or any ships, right? There, there will be this situation where we've been wandering in the open ocean for a long time. Does the captain still know where he's going, <laughs> or is he crazy, right? <laughs> and that that happens also on pirate ship, you know. Like, um, yeah, I think our culture is we we believe in, you know, exploration. Yeah. If something doesn't work, we will try something else. I think we have more tolerance on that, um, making mistakes, than in a AAA situation where you know it's so expensive that you can't afford like five mistakes in a row. Right, <laughs> you will be like running out of money right away. Uh, well, for us, we gave it a lot of time. I think uh, Flower was like the first 75 percent of development is exploration and 25 percent finishing the game yeah uh, and journey it was two years exploring and one year finishing and sky it's kind of crazy now we've been exploring for the first three years for a premium game and then the second three years for a freemium game and we're just about to like enter the finishing you know and it's <clears throat> Like hundreds of levels has been made, 
and in the end we're only gonna keep you know maybe 10 yeah it's just the same level has been remade so many different times that i think you know a lot of people who you know joined tgc a long time ago and left tgc sometime in the middle the biggest uh, torn is just that they don't feel they're making progress right we're trying this direction we're trying that direction we're trying that direction are we making circles or are we gonna find the the new land the, the new continent right um yeah i well i can commiserate because making new ip is hard mm -hmm. it really is and those companies that perhaps don't spend time generating new intellectual property it's hard to understand that you are going to make a lot of mistakes. You're going to move in different directions and false directions and have to rework much of what you thought was going to be in mm -hmm. the final game. And that's hard. And it takes a certain, I think it takes a certain type of person who is flexible and persistent and patient to get to the, the finish line on new IP. Yeah, no. and then and those people, I can guarantee you, they don't know if it's gonna work until it's right. in the market. <laughs> That's right. It's uh, a lot of uncertainty, and uncertainty is kind of the the worst. You know, if yeah. you know you're gonna die tomorrow, it's actually easy. <laughs> uh, but I'm laughing, but that's yes. That's, I imagine it makes those, as you pointed out before, uh -huh. your decisions much clearer. Yeah, it's just it, it, it's a forcing factor. Well. I, you know, one thing, though, that struck me about something you said recently was you, when you talked about Sky, you mm -hmm. said compassion, generos generosity, and collaboration is mm -hmm. the focus. And to me, as a, as a player, that is a refreshing message. And I, I find it refreshing because given the world we see around us today where those qualities seem to be diminishing sometimes, especially when you watch the news and you see our, our leaders talking, having a game that presents the alternative is is heartening so mm -hmm. you guys have been making have been putting out messages these i think positive messages with your games again and again and uh is do you feel like that's a message that you want the world to hear and that's a again sort of a softball question but i, I would love for you to talk about how you personally feel mm -hmm. and <clears throat> when it comes to your games and what they're saying to everybody. Hmm. Uh, yeah, I think every art form, you know, when an artist create, it's always created with a desire of trying to be understood, uh, trying to be heard, trying to be connected. Um, and so, so, Megan Allison is the founder of Annapurna, and I just want to quote a story. Uh, she mentioned, you know, she sometimes felt alone growing up, uh, imagine in her situation, that only through art she felt she is not alone. She's connected with these creators, these storytellers, that she felt she's no different from them. And it's it's that help she had from art made her you know passionate about supporting the artist um and when we create games there are all these feelings about the world and hopefully i mean everybody wants their work and their artwork to be popular to be accepted to be you know celebrated uh, but the only way to do that is to sense the society like sense yeah. The feelings around and the odds are you have some anxiety about something the other people do right um great art always emerge at dramatic tragic times because more people are able to relate towards something that is strong um but you know ultimately each artist has their own voice they they grow up in their own environment and they represent a particular group of people's voice. Uh, we can only hope for that we happen to have a voice that a lot of people adore. And for the artists to stay sane is they have to believe in themselves. They have to believe in their own feelings. And 
to to really capture their own rather than to chase for the trend because that's no longer authentic and so for you know flower journey and sky um i i follow my own instinct uh i tend to tell people like i'm i'm kind of like those old school romantic uh romanticism oil painters you know they like to paint nature but they make it more colorful than real to capture the feeling when they saw the real nature how it feels i mean art is all about exaggeration and the selective uh uh editing like by removing things it en enhances something else um i remember that first piece of art you know it's this clay figure of a lady with big boobs and butts right i mean they call it art why is it art because real people don't have that proportion but with that exaggerated proportion you're like oh god she's kind of sexy uh, of she can give birth to a lot of children of whatever back then people wanted to communicate um and so i remember uh reading these these painters oil painters they wanted to capture the sunset you know cuz you know even with camera if you take a photo of sunset it looks nothing like the real sunset just how red it is right the camera only capture white because it's too bright mm -hmm. uh so in order to capture the brightness of the red they have to put green paint around the red sun to make the red paint appear to be more strong than the rest of the paint the painting right i mean in real life we never see green things around the sun um but ultimately that's kind of who i am i i like to capture beauty beauty can be a beautiful sunset or desert or forest or flower fields but beauty in interaction what is that you know like you mentioned about uh you know how uh, sorry um what i was going to say is you know like today's society there's a lot of thing going on right and why do i want to pick certain side of humanity not the other side of the humanity humanity is gray reality is gray and the reason people love sunset universally is because that's the only 15 minutes when the world is colorful you know it's tainted with color yeah um and so humanity is gray we we do good things we do bad things it's all from the same people like i could be ugly if the condition is right i could be beautiful if the condition is right so what i was hoping to capture was by painting in the form of video game is a beautiful moment between the people and that's what i'm trying to capture I mean, journey is a beautiful moment between two uh i hope i can capture something between more uh in sky uh and in order to capture these beauties you have to exaggerate you have to take out things that is if you want to do something warm you have to take out thing that's cold or you have to actually have a cold thing there to to force the warm to really stand out um one example uh, in in our development in sky is we you know initially we have these people who would be like asking you for something and once you give it to them they just vanish right and and it hurts me a lot cuz i felt like i was cheated um but at the same time if you just make everybody's trade always safe then it becomes kind of mundane like the fact someone could potentially take advantage of your vulnerability actually make other people who don't appear to be a, a more decent person um and i think that happens in world of warcraft you know the whole horde versus alliance the fact the horde can kill you and they choose to not and collab with you is what people remembers 
right? But if you just go to a PVE server, everybody can't kill everybody. You don't you don't talk about those experiences. Yeah. Um. So so yeah, it, to to me, it's just like if all human interaction is a paint, you have to choose selectively. Some people likes to do the very dark side of the things, like you know. Uh, uh, I know there's some uh, Friday the Thirteenth. You know, it's like okay, I'm gonna kill all of you guys, and you have to survive. But I'm I'm gonna kill you anyway. Uh, you know, it's it's one type of game. You know, like it, the the spectrum is wide open. Anybody can pick any color of humanity to make them. There's the funny side. You know, there's the the scary side. There's the you, you know action pack exciting side and i think what i'm trying to paint is that the 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 tender the gentle the the warm side it's just like my style and i don't know why i don't want to make call of duties uh i just honestly i think too many people are making it so it's not cool uh, but i deep down really love something beautiful yeah. um and yeah, so you can see the visual, the audio, they're all kind of like these uh, romantic style. And so making romantic gameplay to me is what differentiates, I guess, uh, to other games. Yeah. That is a fantastic statement. And I, and I think many, many of your fans would agree with you 100% out there. Well, if people want to ask you follow-up questions or just get in touch with you, how do they do that? Uh, <laughs> uh, probably the best way is to uh, reach me by my email. It's just Genova Chen at Gmail or Genova at that game company. Um, Are you on Twitter? I am on Twitter, but I haven't tweeted for years. <laughs> I, I have the same challenge. I'm on Twitter too, and I'm not very good at responding to people or, or uh, really sharing much other than podcast news about the podcast. But uh but that's great. Well, thank you for sharing mm -hmm. that. And, uh, and thanks everybody for listening and thank you for, for sharing so much of yourself. I'm, I'm, I'm really glad you're doing the podcast because you know, like people like me would never have, uh, reached out like this and hopefully this is useful for whoever is out there listening. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks. All right. <laughs>